if you last year, we were studying the book of Philippians, and we were doing, uh, we probably, I don't know how many weeks we spent in Philippians, but we spent um, quite a bit of time. There's only four chapters in the book of Philippians. Can you give me a little bit more volume? Um, interestingly, we're not done with the book of Philippians. We're now finishing that up today. Philippians chapter 4, and we are studying the book of Philippians, and it's Paul's letter to, the, to this particular church, and the title of our message is Keys to Superior Living. Now, I'll, let me just be honest with you. I don't like to begin a new year from a previous series. I don't like to take a series that we're in, and then the new year starts, and then we're still in that same series. I like to kind of start a new year with something fresh, something new. But when I was studying this, the Lord brought out some very, very interesting points. And he showed me that for this new year, that this particular chapter was the chapter for our church, for our people, for, our, for God's people this year. And he used the word, the acronym, superior. In other words, as I was reading this chapter, this is what came to me. Every point in Paul's letter to the Philippians, each point that I came across, each theme, sub-theme that I was studying, formed these letters superior. Superior. And the Lord said that He wants you to live a superior life in Him. That He does not want you to settle for mediocre Christianity. That what you have been and where you have gone and who you were, God wants to change all of that, and He wants you to live on His level. He wants you to be a superior <laughs> Christian. He wants you to live according to His plan, His purpose, His methods, and that is what's going to put you a cut above where you were last year. We're not talking about being superior to somebody else. We're talking about being superior to who you were, or to who you are right now, and who God wants to make you to become. Interestingly, the word superior in the definition just literally means to come up higher. It means to be situated higher. And one of the definitions is a cut above. How many would like to live a cut above where they were last year? Amen? Amen. I know I would. Yep. And how many would like to be situated higher than where they were last year? Okay. Amen? Well, guess what, folks? It's not going to happen if you stay where you're at. If you stay in the current condition that you are. Unfortunately, some of us have become stagnant in our growth as Christians. We have stagnated. We have stopped growing. We're not, we're not spending time with God like we ought to. We're not reading the scriptures like we should. We're not praying like we should. We've actually come to a place where we've become just stagnant. It says, it's as if we've hit a wall and we can't go any further. But I have good news this morning. God is saying, I'm going to take you up another level. And I'm going to take you on beyond just being stagnant and mediocre Christianity. And you are going to learn how to live a superior life in Christ. And if you'll put into practice the principles that you learned today, I guarantee you, you will live, you will experience superior living. And at the end of this message, I'm going to give it to you in one sheet. I'm kind of giving you the answer before... We even close. But I'm gonna give I'm gonna give you this whole sermon on one sheet. And then I want and you'll you'll see how it, it forms with the acronym for superior. And I want you to take that sheet and I want you to put it on your refrigerator. I don't even want you to stick it in your Bible, because if you stick it in your Bible, it's gonna get lost with all your other papers that you don't even know what's in there right now, that you put in there last year or two years ago and they're still in there. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it at your in your cubicle at work. But put it in a place where you frequently go, and when you walk by, you'll remember. You'll see a letter, you'll see a word, you'll see something, and it'll spark something, and God will speak to you, and he'll bless you through it. Amen? Amen. So, we're in the book of Philippians, and you know, people have asked, well, is there any one theme to the book of Philippians? Is there? Well, you have to remember something. Paul is under house arrest. He's been under house arrest for two whole years. And he's writing to a church that has helped him, that has contributed, that has financially blessed him, and ha that has supported his ministry. And so Paul is just simply writing a thank you letter and say, to say thank you for the gift 
Thank you for the support from Epaphroditus. Thank you. That's really what he's doing. And it's one of the most joyful letters in the entire New Testament, of the entire Bible. Letter in the New Testament, the Bible that has more of an, of an attitude of joy than the book of Philippians. And ironically, this is a man in prison writing to his friends at Philippi. And he's telling them, thank you for the gift. But amazingly, if you try to nail down what's the main theme, I would nail it down to this one theme. It's about having joy in the midst of darkness. Having joy when everything in your life is not okay. When you're going through things, and you're hurting, and you're broken, and how God can give you joy in the midst of your pain. That's really the main theme of the book of Philippians. But then, like you would write a letter to a friend, if you were like, let's say you were just writing to a pen pal, you probably have a lot of things you want to share. And that's really sharing a lot of, he's got a of sub-themes that he's writing. He talks about humility, he talks about unity, he talks about prayer, contentment, motives, false teachers. He just goes on and on and on. And that's what we find in chapter 4, is a string of sub-themes, of various themes that Paul wants to talk about. But as I studied this, I saw that if you would put these principles into action, these keys, my friends, it truly will set you on a path to superior living. Amen? Amen? So I'm going to give it to you as we read it. It's going to be 23 verses, but we're just going to go right through it, and we'll go right through all eight. And by the way, you know how many letters? Eight. Do you know what number eight is in the Bible? New beginning. New beginning. New beginning. What is today? It's a new day. It's a new year. We have a new beginning. This is a new beginning for us. Just want to make that correlation. Like number seven is perfection. Number eight is new beginning. So if you study uh, Jewish tradition, there's what I believe is called a gematria. It comes from, I believe it's from the, the Jewish tradition and how they can take actually numbers and numbers have symbols. Uh, how many know number 666 is a symbol? But numbers in the Bible are significant. And number eight is a symbol of a new beginning. And so I believe that as we begin 2020, this is our new beginning. And this is a great way to start the year off. And I believe it's these principles that will help you get through. Now, I'm going to do my best to get you all eight principles in the next 30 minutes and get you out of here. Because I have a meeting after. All right? So we want to make sure that we get this to you. So number one, and, then, and we're just going to read, and, it's, and here's what's amazing. These letters were formed consecutively from verses 1 through 23. I didn't jumble these up. So it's, it's 1 through 23, and I'm going to give you the first one. The letter S stands for stand firm in the Lord. Amen. And this is what Paul says. Therefore, as we start this chapter, therefore my... Brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown stand firm in the Lord. In this way, dear friends. So he says to stand firm. Other translations say, be strong in the Lord. But to stand firm in the Lord. I was thinking about this and how that we are called by God to not operate in our own strength. We're not called of God to operate in our own ability. And that's why Paul says not just to stand firm, but to stand firm in the Lord. What you do for God, you don't do in your own strength. You do in His strength. His ability. Like my little boy when I was walking through the mall. We were in a little bookstore. And I took a little aerial shot of him trying to push the baby carriage. And he got tired of being in that thing, and I set him down, and he's tried to push that thing, and it's like, and he's doing like this, and, and he's like, and he can't really push it. But he's trying to do it in his own strength. But when he put his hand on there, and I, I, he was just like, <laughs> he thought he was a big shot. I mean, literally, he's walking around like, and he has no idea that the real power and the real strength is coming from his daddy. Amen. 
And just like you, your real strength and your real power comes from your Heavenly Father. Learn how this year to be strong in Jesus, strong in the Lord, and not in your own strength. His strength, strong in His ability, and if I that to you practically all of your endeavors throughout 2020, I want you to start using this vocabulary. Whatever you're going to do, whenever you're going to do it, Lord, help me. Lord, give me strength for today. Lord, help me to do this. Lord, if you're starting, if you're starting a new job, Lord, help me to do my job. Lord, help me. Give me strength. Give me ability. Stop trying to do everything on your own and start depending on his strength and his ability. And start learning to let, let that be in your vocabulary in everything that you endeavor to accomplish, everything that you endeavor to do. <coughs> because you're going to need it. We are on a course for God only knows what in 2020. And there are going to be challenges and there are going to be things that you're going to face. And you may find yourself in situations you never thought you found yourself in, and you're going to be crying out, Lord, help me. Give me the strength for this. And God is going to tell you, be strong. Don't try to do this in your own self. You think Gideon, we talked about this on New Year's Eve, you think Gideon, with a force of only 32,000 people, could defeat an army of 135,000 men and warriors? He's got 32,000 men. He's up against an army of 135,000 soldiers. And God says, you got too much, Gideon. Too much. And God says, look, you defeat them with this amount? He says, the Israelites will take glory. They'll take the fame. They'll take the credit. They'll be able to boast. He says, tell them to boast. 22,000 men, gone. Wow. <laughs> Left with 10,000. And then God says, you still got too many. Wow. What? And then we know the story. He tells them to go down to the brook and those who lap like a dog versus those who cup with the hand, and he says, separate them. He says, that will tell you who your real warriors are. And 300 warriors are left. The ones that are looking up and are observing, that are lapping like this. Those are the ones he says to keep. But the ones who put the face down in the ground and laugh like dogs, he tells them to go home. So he kept the warriors, 300 warriors. How logically do 300 men defeat an army of 135,000? And he doesn't even let them take swords. He doesn't take jars with torches inside and horns, the chauffeur. But God did. He turned that whole army on each other. When they heard the horns and they heard the jars break and the torches were lit up on that hilltop, the army just turned on each other and started killing each other. They didn't know who was who. And then they fled into the towns in Israel and the other Israelites got them and killed them. 300 men. You think Gideon was strong in himself? Or you think he was strong in the Lord? Gideon was afraid. But he did it anyway because he knew that it was better to obey God than to succumb to his fear. Friends, I like what Joyce Meyer says. Even if you're afraid, just do it. Do it afraid. Don't be afraid. I mean, don't, don't, what am I trying to say? It's okay to acknowledge that you're afraid, but do it anyway. And do it by faith. And trust the Lord to give you the help. So if you're starting something new, you're going into a new area, a new arena that you're not comfortable, it's out of your comfort zone, you say, Lord, help me, and then step out in faith. And you'll watch the hand of the boy up there, the way I helped him. Glory to God. Let me give you number two, because we will be here all All right. Now Paul says this in verse two. He says, I plead to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. What Paul says here, to be united in mind, be united in what he's saying, folks, is be united in one vision, one purpose. How many know that these two people in the church didn't get along all that well? They were like oil and water, all right? These two ladies in the church, Euodia and Saint, 
I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it, pronounce it the name right. But they didn't get along. And Paul had got wind of this. And he got word of it. And he's saying, listen, you guys, here, be of the same mind. That's what he tells them to do. Do you know what that literally means? That literally means... And come and rally around God's purpose. Come and rally around and support God's vision for your church. Come support that. In other words, let's stop fighting with each other. Let's figure out what the vision God has given us. And let's support that. And let's, all of us, let's pull the wagon in the same direction. You ever see two little kids trying to pull a wagon? And one's pulling it in this direction. And the other one's pulling it in this direction. God is saying, get on the same page and learn to pull the wagon in the same direction. Have the same mind. And so, and that's something he tells us to do. So we have to be united in purpose, in vision, and in mind. We have to think like Christ. The Bible says two can't walk together lest they be agreed. And you can't, and even in your, even with your, your spouses. I don't know, I don't know, I was going to go here right now, but I'm just going to go here for a second. <laughs> Wasn't part of my message. But, you know, these are two people. And he's telling them to be of the same mind. How awesome would it be if you and your spouse were of the same mind? Instead of being on a separate page all the time. Because that's, where you, that's why you're fighting all the time. And you're getting on each other's nerves all the time. You're not on the same page. Get on the same page. And it will do wonders. And here's what I love. Do you notice it doesn't say just be of the same mind? It says be of the same mind in the Lord. In the Lord. Now that can go in a lot of different directions. But I'll just carry on from that previous thing. You know, you got to do this with the help of the Lord. You've got to invite the Lord into your marriage. You've got to invite him into your life. You have to invite him into it between the two of you. You have, to, you have to recognize that it's God who puts you two together. And it's both of you on the same trip and on the same journey. And you're both pulling the wagon in the same direction. But you're not going to be unified if you're fighting with each other all the time. Be unified. Be, be of the same mind. How do I do that, Pastor? You don't understand. I live with the devil. <laughs> well, cast them out. No, I'm just kidding. No, just kidding. I forgot this is being filmed. Like, and it's like live stream. Like, you can't take that back. And that's well, let me just say this. You, in all of your disagreements, and you're going to have disagreements, you may not agree on everything. It's okay to agree to disagree. Means exactly, but, but start with respect. Once you start respecting each other, that you've really crossed the line. Fight, I don't care if you raise your voice, don't, and don't raise your voice, but if I don't care what you do, but don't lose respect for each other. And don't disrespect one another. Once you cross that line of disrespecting and you start name calling, you're headed for trouble. And if you've done that, you need to come back and repent and repent to your spouse. And both of you get on and say, listen, I'm sorry, I said some things I shouldn't have said. Forgive me to not go there again and do that. And when you argue, try your best to argue in a mild voice. It'll go a lot better than, you don't know what you did to me! I'm going to... <laughs> That's just not going to help. It's not me. No, no. My wife's like very meek and quiet. No, my wife could be arguing with you and you won't even know she's arguing. You'd be like, what? <laughs> And we're not perfect at it. No. But you got to keep working at it. But if you're going to live a superior life, if you're going to put mediocre living below, you, behind you, and you're going to come up a little higher, and you want to live a cut above, work at being the same mind. Work at being unified. In your mind, your purpose, and spirit, and thought, work at it. Number three, P of the superior. Praise the Lord at all times. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. I will say it again. Rejoice. There's a reason why the Apostle Paul mentions rejoice two times. All right? Because he doesn't want you to take this for granted. Re the word rejoice or joy in one form or another, depending on which translation you're using, occurs between 12 and 16 times in this small four chapters in the book of Philippians. I mean, are you kidding me? 12 to 16 times the word joy appears in the book of Philippians? And it can come into the different forms of joy or 
the King James is rejoice and uh, glad and like 16 times. Here's a man in prison telling you to praise the Lord. Rejoice. But he doesn't say, well, just do it once. He says, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. That's the attitude in which he wrote that. that in other words, he's just so excited. I mean, how do you get there? How do you get from a place where you are locked up, you don't have your freedom, you're going to be put on trial, and you're rejoicing, and you're telling somebody else to rejoice, and then you come out and say again, I say to you, rejoice. My friends, I believe one of the reasons why Paul says to rejoice is because he knew that as long as you're rejoicing, your circumstances can't keep you there. Amen. Your situation can't keep you there. You can come out of your pain and your darkness through consciously, actively, unpurposely rejoicing. To say, Lord, it doesn't matter what I'm facing, what I'm going through. I'm choosing to rejoice. I'm choosing to praise you and give you glory and honor in the midst of my pain. It doesn't matter because, God, you are greater than my pain. One person said, wake up every morning. Will be glad in it, even when things are not so great and things, and you don't feel like praising. And you, you got to give God the sacrifice of praise. Give Him the sacrifice of your lips and praise Him. Another quote: When you have an attitude of praise, you won't be able to outrun the goodness of God, because what you send up will come back down. When you have an attitude of praise, you will not be able to outrun the goodness of God. Because when praises go up, blessings come down. God inhabits the praises of His people. You want more of God's presence? Praise Him. Give Him praise. Give Him thanks. Open your mouth. You're good at opening your mouth in other ways. And sometimes at the wrong people. Open your mouth and give God praise. Let those blessings come out. And as you do, you will create an environment where God can begin to operate and move and manifest in your life. And you'll bring more good in your life and more of, of the things of God, the, 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 how do I say, it? the more of the movement of God will occur in your life than if you are complaining all the time. Because you and I both know complaining will open the door to the enemy. It will open the door. Praises bring blessing. Complaining bring curses. That's the way it goes. Even you even studied in the Old Covenant. Look at Deuteronomy 28. God says, if you don't serve me with gladness, one of the curses, he says, I'll turn your enemies on you. He says, he'll make the heavens brass above you. <clears throat> the land won't produce its fruit if you don't serve the Lord with gladness. Now, I don't believe God's trying to manipulate you or try to put a knife in your rib and say, sir, praise me. I don't think that's what he's doing. I don't think that's what this is all about. But there's a principle here. And there's a principle that something gets released in the realm of the spirit when you praise. Something happens. Spiritual activity all around you. There's, that's going on right now whether you can see it or not. There are angelic beings. Heavenly and demonic. And they're happening all around. And you know what they're looking for? Looking to get a hold of your tongue. If they can get a hold of your tongue and get you to say the wrong things and speak curses over you. I'm dying. I'm nobody. I wish I were dead. You start saying that. Those angelic beings in the realm of the spirit begin to work and plot. And you are the one who gave access. And you give access with your words. That's why Proverbs says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Because what you sow with your mouth, you will reap in your life. Don't ever forget it. It's a biblical principle. You sow praise, good things are going to come. You sow complaining and murmuring and strife, and you sow all that, it's going to come back on just telling you, I'm trying to save you from unnecessary trouble. Watch your words. Watch what comes out of your mouth. Put a praise song. It, find something that you can just give God thanks for. If you can't find anything, just, just, just thank Him that you're saved. Lord, thank you that I'm saved. 
Thank you for saving me. Thank you for delivering me. Thank you for being a good God. Thank you for my family. Thank you. You know, just thank Him. Maybe you, you, don't, you can't thank Him for everything because you don't have everything, but thank Him for the things that you do have. Maybe you don't have the best job in the world, but thank Him you got one. Maybe you don't drive the best car in the world, but, and you're driving a jalopy, but thank God you got one. Be thankful. Because there's millions of people all over the world right now that don't have any of this. And they can't thank God for any of that because they don't have it. Thank God. Thank God you have breath in your lungs. Thank God you're, you're still alive. But be thankful. And let it, let it, an attitude of gratitude will take you a long way in the kingdom of God. And you know what will happen? I just heard this in the spirit. Your praise will make you impenetrable to the forces of darkness. Amen. Because as you praise, and as that fountain of praise comes out, you will build a fortress of God's presence around you, and the enemy will not be able to penetrate that. Praise Amen. God. But you want to have the enemy wreaking havoc in your life? Start complaining, and you'll start shooting holes through that wall, and that enemy will slip in there. Number E, letter E, superior. Eliminate worry and pray. Verse 5. Isn't it amazing how all these just verses, we're just reading in consecutive and it's just forming these letters. Isn't that awesome? Eliminate worry and pray. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. I think about Paul. I thought, you know, Paul surely had something to worry about. He didn't know what exactly where his fate was going to be. He was con confident that the Lord was going to deliver him. But yet there is probably this side of him that said, you know, it's possible that I might be executed. I'm in prison. I may not win this trial. He's going to trial. I may not get out of this. He had all the reason in the world to worry, and yet he says to not be worried about anything. Don't be anxious about anything. Friends, I think when we read that, we don't pay attention to that. Because most of us are world-class worriers. We really are. We know how to worry better than anything else. If you had to show somebody how to worry, you could be like, oh, let me show you that. You'd be, you're, just, you're just an expert. I mean, you, you could, you could, if I asked you to give a Bible lesson on worry, you'd go, oh yeah, Pastor, I can do that. But I'm challenged by this. Because he says, don't be anxious about anything. And I mean anything. What does that mean to you right now? What you're facing, what you're going through, a sickness, a financial challenge. What does it mean to you? Can I really not worry? Yes. Because God would never ask you to do something He's not prepared to give you the grace to do. Amen. He wouldn't tell you to do it if He didn't think you could do it. The Bible says His commandments are not grievous. And with His will, He gives you His grace. Whatever He tells you to do in His word, He gives you the grace to accompany that so that you can accomplish it. I've been challenged by this. I've had things happen in the last couple weeks. Not in this ministry, but outside of here. Other ministries that I'm involved in that have challenged me. And I had to get to the place. And I said, Lord, I cast the care of this over on you. This is, not, this is beyond my ability to control or deal with. But I'm putting it in your hands. It's not easy because the next thing I'm thinking is I'm starting to worry back worry about the situation again. But I say, Lord, you are not a man that you should lie, neither the son of man that you should repent. And you said you're near, and you said don't be anxious about anything, so I'm not going to be anxious about this. But I'm going to pray, and I'm going to pray it through. And once I did that, and I bring my prayer, my petition, with thanksgiving before the Lord, and present my case before the Lord, something miraculous happened. It's as if there's this supernatural peace that begins to transcend all understanding and fills my heart and it guards your heart and guards your mind 
in Christ Jesus. And even though the situation hasn't changed, it hasn't affected me. It hasn't gotten in here. It hasn't gotten in here. Now, I've had situations where it got in my, not only in my mind, but it started to get into my heart. Once it crosses from your mind to your heart, you're going to have trouble. Have trouble. But I've had those situations. And not too long ago, either. And the Lord directed me to read through the Psalms. And I began to read through the Psalms. And I began to read through the Psalms. And I began to read other scriptures. Scriptures on, 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 uh, on strength and encouragement. Uh, just various scriptures that I could, I could get a hold of. And I found that the more that I did that, and I did this through like audio. You can go online, you can get audio verses. You can get Bible <coughs> audio and just, just put, put it on. Put Bible verses for encouragement. Bible verses for strength. And as I began to do that, something happened. The anxiety began to just wash out of my heart and out of my mind. And I was able to pray through that. And God was able to work something miraculous, something awesome. I'm not a privilege to say because it's, it's public right now. But God is so good, and God knows what he's doing. <clears throat> and I said, Lord, you're the one who said, don't be anxious. But I'm feeling this anxiety right now. And that was the direction. And as I began to do that, man, by the time I got up from that, Pastor Ken, I was walking, I was praising God. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God, I got the victory. And nothing has changed. And I'm, but, but in here, I've got the victory. Amen. And I've got it here. And that's all that matters. And God is turning that, that whole situation, he's turning it around. And it's awesome. Now that's a whole lot better than sitting there And it doesn't solve anything. Isn't that what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6? Who of you, by worrying, can add one cubit of stat to your stature? Who of you, by worrying, can add one ounce of good to your life? By worrying? I mean, I, I, I remember when, uh, I mean, he didn't, you know, she didn't like this, but I remember when uh, Brother Hayden, he was walking up the steps through his parsonage and his wife was right behind him. And she said, you know, you just won't worry about anything. And he's like, you know, because that's how he was trained. And that's what he taught us. You know, you don't worry about it. You just, you just cast your cares on the Lord. You won't worry. So his wife says, you, don't, you won't worry about anything. And she says, you know, if me and the kids just dropped dead right here, you wouldn't worry. And he turned and looked at her and said, what's the use of worrying then if you're already dead? <laughs> she did not like that. <laughs> Let's move on. Superior, the R, comes after the E. Renew your minds and develop right thinking. Right thinking, not stinking thinking, right thinking. We want to have right thinking, amen? What, is, what does he say in the next verse? Finally, my brothers, verse 8, and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, what is, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. My friends, I believe the Word of God is a great place to develop right thinking. Because the Word is true, it is noble, it is right, it is pure, it is lovely, it is admirable, it is excellent, it is praiseworthy. Jesus is true, right, noble, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. He says to think about such things. So get your mind, see, when in that situation I was able to get my mind off of my circumstance and I began to get it onto the Word of God. And, that, and, I, and the more that I began to think about that, it began to change me. The Word began to convert me. The Bible says that His words, that His Word converts the soul. His Word began to convert me. It began to change me. It began to do something in me. And, th and that happens when you put your mind on the right things, especially the Word of God. When you set your mind on the Word, it will begin to change your perspective. It will begin to change your views, your thinking. It changes everything. I, I love what Brother Higgins said. He said, right thinking produces right believing, and right believing produces right 
talking or confession. Wrong thinking produces wrong believing, and wrong believing produces wrong confessing. Let me break it down for you. If I think right, and I'm talking about thinking biblically, I'm thinking right, I'm going to naturally believe right. And if I'm believing right, I'm going to naturally talk right. I'm going to talk what I'm believing. You always talk what you really believe. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But if you think wrong, you're thinking contrary to the Word of God, you're thinking negatively, and you're pondering on that, you're going to believe wrong. You're going to, be, you're going to believe what you've been thinking about, what you're thinking of. And if you're thinking wrong and you're believing wrong, you're not going to be talking right either. You're going to be talking wrong. It's just a simple principle. Think right, you'll believe right. If you believe right, you'll talk right. And vice versa. You think wrong, you're going to believe wrong. You believe wrong, you're going to talk wrong. And you know what? I can add on to that. Eventually you're going to start living wrong. Think right, you'll believe right. If you believe right, you'll talk right. If you talk right, you'll walk right. If you think wrong, you're going to believe wrong. If you believe wrong, you're going to talk wrong. If you talk wrong, eventually you're going to walk wrong. It all, it all follows. But where does it start? The mind. Thinking. Friends, where your mind goes, the body follows. I just read an article. Major minister, major minister, used in mightily in miracles, Frank. Real miracles, verifiable miracles. He just was sat down in ministry. Sat down. Why? Sexual immorality. Sexting. Sending, having interns working for him in the ministry and having the interns, young females, send him nude pictures of themselves. They call it sexting, thong. Do you think he started that overnight? No. That, that, was, that was something that was rooted in him for many, 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 many years. And it just, it just he never dealt with that strongly. Could do, and God was, you know, and maybe he was the type who was, he kept falling into it and repenting and falling into it and repenting. I don't know. But eventually it caught up with him. And it came, all came out. I can tell you he was not practicing this. Because what you think about, you eventually will perpetuate. And it all starts, my friends, with a little seed. If you let that seed germinate in your mind, it'll get in your heart, and it'll begin to work in you, work through you. The moment those thoughts come, you have to arrest them. You have to take authority over them. You have to say, I bind you in Jesus' name. I break your power. That's a lesson for another time. But you have to arrest them. Just like a police officer would arrest a criminal. He sees a criminal doing something, breaking into a building. Do you think that police officer is going to arrest him? He should, right? you got thoughts trying to break into your mind every single day. Hundreds of thoughts trying to break into you, to get to you. And you got to arrest him. In Jesus' name. It's not your authority. A police officer doesn't have any authority except for the authority that he's been invested with. By the state and the county and the government and, the, and the, the country. It's the corporate powers that give him that authority to arrest. It's the corporate authority of heaven that gives you the authority to say no in Jesus' name. No! It's the authorities in that name. And you break its power. You take authority over it. 
Well, I don't know. I've never heard anything like that, Pastor. I don't know where the country boys came from. It sounded good. I'm going to just give you this one verse. Uh, one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. You don't have to turn it. I'll just read it to you. Verse 4. For though, verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. In other words, though we're walking in this human body, in the flesh, we're not fighting with each other in the flesh. No, this, these, are, these are spiritual battles, mental battles, these are thought battles. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, meaning they're not worldly, they're not from this world. Our we the Christian's weapons are not from this world. But mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. I guarantee that that minister had a stronghold. But it didn't happen overnight. There was an open door. And that open door led to that. And it built a stronghold in his life. And a stronghold is a fortress. And when it gets built, it's very hard to get out of that. You become a prisoner in it. And you, ver you become very good at compartmentalizing. You put on a face. It could be your pastor smiling at you and thinking other thoughts. Now, thank God I'm not. God is my witness. I try, I try my hardest to live a transparent life before you. And I try to live a holy life and a pure life. Because I don't wake up in the morning and see you. I wake up in the morning and I have to answer to God. Amen. I cannot... And I don't say this boastfully, but I cannot, in good conscience, stand behind this pulpit with sin in my heart. I cannot, and I will not. I'll step down before I do that. And every pastor listening to this should do the same. Amen. In honor for him, and in honor for the people you serve. Amen. And this is what he says. Casting down arguments, or thoughts, or the King James says, casting down imaginations. Those imaginations that come. Cast it down. How do you cast it down? I bind you. I cast you down in Jesus' name. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You have to bring it into captivity. Those thoughts come. Man, I'm talking to you. Pornography. Sexual addiction. you got to take authority over your mind. And you don't do it by staring at it. You've got to turn and say, no, I'm not going to give over to this. I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Amen. Don't open the door. Because the little door that you open up to the devil, the devil will come and he will take you over. He will try to gain as much ground as he possibly can. That's why Paul said in Ephesians, don't give the devil a foothold. A foothold. That means like somebody, picture somebody holding on to your foot. My little Zion, he always has a foothold on me. Grabs that leg and, and then my other girls, they get on the other leg and the one's on my back and I'm just like, I can't do anything. Now imagine that being your life. The devil's got a foothold on your leg. You, you're you're going you're gonna to struggle, friends. You're going to struggle through life. You don't need it. I didn't even plan to say any of this stuff, so obviously I believe God's trying to say something. Let's, let's move on because we got, uh, we got three more, I-O-R. And then Paul says in verse 9, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Now, folks, I'm not going to spend much time on this because it's very, we spent... Three weeks on this series from the book of Philippians talking about following in the footsteps of the Apostle Paul. So if you want to go back, I encourage you to go back and get that, listen to that series. Listen to those three prior messages that have come right in a row. And it was, we talked about multiple things of how we are to follow Paul's example. What we looked at was, what was Paul's example? He says, follow my example. He says that in chapter 3, follow it. And, he, and so we get asked, what, well, Paul, what is your example? And we began to look at that. And we came up with three sermons on that. So go back and watch that, and you'll be blessed by it or listen to it on the audio podcast on SoundCloud. But I think...
verse 24, and I'll, I'll read it to you. Well, I'm actually almost out of time. But Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 says it this way. He says, in Matthew 7, I, I, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, because I'm already out of time, but I'm going to give you this last point, and it will all... All right, Matthew 7, look, look, look at this, verse 24 through 27. He says, this is the words of Jesus. He says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So Jesus uses an example from nature. And he says there were rains that came and floods and winds that blew. And he says that the wise man is like the person who builds his house on a solid foundation. And when those weathery storms come and hit, it's still standing. But the man who built his house on sand, same storm, same wind, same rain, comes and washes away his foundation and he falls and he crashes. What was the difference? The wise man, he says, was a doer of Jesus' words. But the foolish man was not a doer. He heard the word, but he didn't do it. Because you could, folks, you could sit in church all day and not listen. I mean, you could be listening, but if you don't put into practice what you hear, it won't profit you. Amen. The only part of God's word that will profit you is the part that you do. And we have built a myth in the body of Christ. That we think if we hear enough of the word, it's going to do its job. It's going to set us free. That's only half. You've got to put the other half, which is be a doer. That's what James says. Be ye doers of the word. It's the, and not just a hearer only. Whoever is a hearer of the word is like a person who looks at his face in the mirror, and then he goes away and forgets what he looks like. But the person who is a doer of the word is a person who looks into the perfect law of liberty and doesn't forget what he hears, but he's a doer of the work, King James says, and this man shall be blessed in his deed. Be a doer. It sounds so simple, but yet, folks, it's the hardest thing to do. How do you be a doer? I'm going to give you a very simple formula. You can't do what you don't know. You cannot be a doer of what you don't know. You have to, you have to in order for you to, to know what to do, you've got to spend time in the living book. You've got to spend time with the author and get to know what the author said and let his words become a fortress on the inside of you, in your mind and in your heart. Plant that seed, plant those words in your heart and as you walk with God, as those seeds get planted and embedded in your heart, as you begin to walk with the Lord, the Lord will quicken those words to you in every life situation. Everything, everything you do, whatever it is you're facing, God can quicken something to you. And it'll cause that word to come up on the inside. But it's going to happen by reading, studying, and meditating on the word of God. If you really want to know where it's going to happen, it's going to happen when you meditate the word. When you're thinking about the word. Pondering the word. My pastor used to say this. Read the Bible. If you read it, you'll come up with questions. If you study the Bible, you'll come up with answers. If you meditate on the word, you'll come up with ammunition. Because God will cause what he's deposited in your heart to come out. And it'll be, it'll be, you'll, you'll face something and it, it will come out. It'll, God will quicken something to you. God will speak something to you in that moment. But you can't act on what you don't know. So you have to get it in you in order for you to be a doer of the word. Let's just finish this. Number, number, uh, well, the letter O, overcome through the spirit. This is going to go very fast. I rejoice greatly, verse 10, in the Lord, that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My friends, this does not mean that you can be anything that you want to be. This verse does not mean when you say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
You know, that does not mean that I can just wake up tomorrow and be a rocket scientist. That does not mean that. But sometimes we quote it like that. What Paul is talking about in context here is this. The man is in prison, and he's, there's times where he's hungry. There's times where he's well fed. There's times where he has plenty. There's times where he does not. And it looks like this is a situation at times that I'm not going to make it. And then it just seems like there's times where like I have more than I need. And there's times where I don't have enough. And Paul is saying here that no matter what my circumstances are, no matter what I'm dealing with, no matter the situation, whether I've got a lot or I've got a little, no matter what, the Lord Jesus is with me and his presence is helping me. Amen. That's what he's saying. And that's why he says, I can do all things. Through Christ. Translate that word Christ. It means anointed one. It means anointed one. Jesus is the anointed one. It's the anointing that's on, on, on him. It's I can do all things through Christ, the anointed one. And his anointing, which strengthens me. In other words, which puts me over. Which makes me sufficient to the task at hand. Or makes me sufficient to whatever it is I'm dealing with. That's what he's saying. Let me read that from the Amplified. It says, I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Somebody say amen. amen. That's what he's saying. God is saying to let the Spirit overcome. Let the Spirit be the dominating factor in your life by depending solely upon Him. <clears throat> Depend upon the Lord Jesus Christ in the hour of trial that this world is about to go through. Depend on the Spirit of the living Christ in all the situations that you face. Learn to say, Lord, help me. Give me the grace. Learn to say and put this in your mouth. Put this in your pipe and smoke it. <coughs> what do you mean? <coughs> Learn to put it in your mouth by getting it in your heart. And meditate on, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can get through any situation. Actually, I love, you know, the modern translators of the NIV, the 2011 edition, they actually translated it actually more accurately than people want to give them credit for it. I hated the, when it came out, the new translation, because I've always followed the NIV 84 edition, but the 2011 revised edition that came out last couple of years ago, or a few years ago, I hated the way they translated it. In the old edition, they said, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. But the, when they revised it, they just translated it this way. I can do all this through him. I can do all this. I can do all this through, I can do all this through him. I think it says, who strengthens me. And I was like, why does he have to say I can do all this through him? Well, they kept it in context. What he's saying is I can do all this, these challenges that I'm being faced with right now, being in prison, being in this mess, I can, I can get through this through the strength of Christ. That's what he's saying. And friends, I submit it to you. You can get through anything this world will throw at you in these last times. And you will get through it. Because greater is he that's in you Amen. than he that's in this world. Amen. Don't ever forget it. Give the Lord some praise. Amen. Last one, and we're done. And actually what's great is verses 14 through 23. Just carry along. I'm going to, this is the R. Release what's in your hand. I'm going to read it and I'm going to end it here. Yet it was good of you to share in my trouble. And I, now, i got these handouts here. So... Please take a handout. Actually, I'm going to at this time, Pastor Ken, will you pass these out? So, just pass these out. I'm going to give this to you. Just, Judith, if you could pass those out. And just, I'm going to re read this to you. Uh, release what's in your hand. We're done. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts, but what I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received... Let me hit this down here. 
controversy. He says, I have received full payment and I have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from the prophet Dias the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering as an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And then the end here is basically just a salutation. He says, to our God and Father, be glory forever. Greet all God's people in Christ Jesus, the brothers and sisters who are with me. Send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. That's the end of the book of Philippians. And But I just want to draw your attention back to uh, verse 16 where Paul says uh, that really what he's saying here. Uh, I've been able to be, I've been able to get through this time is what he's really saying and he says now look he says and this is what he says he goes you know I'm not it's not that I desire anything from you it's not that I desire he goes but what I really want is I want I want what you give to be accredited back to you is really what he's saying I think that the contemporary English version says it best he says I want you to receive the blessings that come from giving that's really what he's saying. He's saying, look, I'm amply supplied. I really don't need anything from you. Why? Because I can do all things with Christ who strengthens me. But you're the only one that's given to me in this ministry. He says, and really what I want is I want you to get credit for your giving. I want you to get blessed. You see? There's, and, that's, and that's why, watch this, that's why when you go to the next verse, in verse 18, he says, your offering, he says, from off in Paphrodite, is like a fragrant offering. A sweet-smelling sacrifice pleasing to God. Do you know, friends, that you're giving? Listen to me very carefully. You're giving before God? The attitude in which you give before God is more important than the amount that you give. The amount you give is important, but the attitude in which you give is more important to God than just the amount. Because if you give with a grudging attitude, it's not going to be a fragrant offering. It's not going to have the aroma of Christ on it. It's going to be a stench in the nostrils of God. But when you give cheerfully and you give joyfully, as Paul says, God loves a cheerful giver, you're giving a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice that's pleasing to God. And when you do that, God says, and this is the promise to you, and my God, Paul says, will meet all your need or needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Stand to your feet. Release what's in your hand. Release what's in your hand. What am I saying? <clears throat> Friends, in 2020, and I please hear my heart. I'm not saying this to get your money. I hear me hard and hear me loud. I'm saying this because I want you to be blessed. If you will learn to be a giver and you will do it cheerfully, God will meet all your needs according to his glory in Christ Jesus. If you don't learn to be a giver and you don't give cheerfully, I cannot stand here and promise that God will meet all of your needs that's right. because it's a principle. It's a principle that's at work. And it's all the way through Scripture from Genesis Amen. to Revelation. Amen. It's there, folks. Yes. It's there. If you've never tithed before, I encourage you, let 2020 be the year that you start tithing. And you watch God protect you in ways and bless you in ways and protect you in ways that you have not seen before. If you've not tithed, if you have not tithed to your church, even if you don't go to this church, if you go to another church, then you go back to that church and you tithe in the church where you're being fed. But you tithe and you watch, God will bless you. Because the Bible says that they that honor me, I will honor. When you honor God with your giving, God says, I'll honor you. It's, 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 it's Bible. Proverbs chapter 3 says, honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all your increase. And so shall your barns be filled with plenty, and your wine presses will burst forth with new wine. I'm going to stop there, but folks, please take this little sheet that I gave you. I'm sorry I went way over, but we got, guess what? Next Sunday, we're going to start the book of Revelation. Amen. That's why I wanted to get this out of the way. So yes, give the Lord some praise. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be, it's going to be uh, we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to do my best to have visuals out there for you, so you can actually see and understand what this book is about. But put this somewhere where you can see it, and when you're walking by, your eyes may catch a word, and God might quicken something to you. 
Don't throw it out. Friends, this is about learning to live superior in 2020. Learning to live not a mediocre, but a cut above where you were last year. And to, and to come up higher in Him. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, we just thank you. We give you praise, glory, and honor. Lord, I ask that what we have heard today, that you will bless your people. And God, I ask that you will make your face shine upon them. Lord, lift up your countenance upon them. Grant them your shalom and your peace. Lord, bless your people with prosperity, favor, and protection in this new year as we go forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give the Lord some praise.